Gary, you've been doing this all, you know, 50 years, activist, revolutionary, historian. When was the last time you wrote a letter, an open letter, on a Tuesday morning, and by that afternoon, you got exactly what you wanted? I'm thinking of February the 9th this year. You wrote that open letter, you co-wrote that open letter with key Aboriginal activists, and that afternoon, Eddie McGuire resigns. That's a pretty good hit rate. Um, there was a lot of lead-up work to that, but uh, to achieve that result in the space of 48 hours or whatever it was, was um, um, pretty remarkable, especially when you consider um, how long uh, Eddie had been there, how many times over that 20 years or so um, various people had tried to knock him off. I'm not saying that we knocked him off, I'm just saying that uh, we managed in the space of 48 hours what a lot of other people hadn't managed in 20 years. So what's next? I mean, are you going to go after other CEOs, other clubs? I mean, Western Bulldogs don't have any Indigenous players on their list. I mean, I mean or is it just well, Collingwood or how do you see it? I think Leon Davis made a really, said some really good things in The Guardian the other day where he made the point, which is, you know, absolutely correct, that the problem isn't really Eddie or Collingwood, per se. I mean, the problem that you can see manifesting itself in Collingwood uh, is a problem that pervades the whole of Australian society. You know, so in one sense, today Collingwood, um, tomorrow the AFL, and the day after Australian society in general. I mean, the, the basic problem that's been exposed there is the pervasive racism that is so normal uh, normalised in Australian society that uh, people don't even realise what is happening around them sometimes, as is indicated by the letters from the Collingwood players who apologised. I mean, you know, some people may think that's belated, but I think that um, uh, it's an indicative of, of how normalised racism is in Australian society that most non-coloured people aren't even conscious of it. Whereas, on the other hand, um, every person of colour in Australia, every Aboriginal person, every person of colour in Australia experiences um, racism on a daily, if not hourly basis throughout from the day they're born to the day they die. So, you know, it's hopefully what will come out of the Collingwood thing will be a greater examination on the broader Australian society. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not confident. I mean, you know, the, the response of Collingwood so far in creating this little committee of eminent people, um, you know, it's, a, it's the classic sort of Band-Aid measure, which well, I've that, seen a thousand times. That's all I want to get at. Like, I mean, the Do Better report talks about structural change. In your letter, you talk about a quote, finding of systematic racism is not an excuse for powerful individuals to avoid accountability by blaming a lack of policies and procedures. So over and above better policy and procedures, what do you think is necessary in, foot, in football at Collingwood and just generally in the AFL? I think that they, um, if they're going to appoint um, Aboriginal people onto boards of either clubs or the AFL itself, they need to be getting people like Leon Davis, like Heritier Lumumba. They're the sort of people who've got the answers, you know. They're the sort of people who are in a position to assist clubs to really, if they're really going to be honest about the whole process, and the AFL included, then they have to listen to other people. The people who are there now in the AF, the, on the board of the AFL, on the board of Collingwood, and now on, the board, on this little committee of people who are going to solve the problem, um, they've been there for a long time. I mean, the fact that it's reached this stage is an indication of the failure of whatever it was they thought they were doing there. And they, they really should step aside. It's not just Eddie who needs to step aside. I think the entire board of Collingwood needs to step, step down. I think the, the only way you're going to have significant cultural change within Collingwood or the AFL is to change the, the advice that you're getting. I mean, I really... Leon Davis's statements really caught me by surprise. Um, I'd always looked upon him as a, a brilliant footballer. I didn't um, think that he, you know, like me looking at most footballers, and nothing against footballers, um, 
I didn't think that he had the, the depth of um, understanding that he clearly has. And the fact that he's come out, I think, is also further embarrassment to Collingwood. And it further raises into question whether this group of people that they've appointed is really going to be in a position to be able to bring about the substantial change that's needed. Without hearing from people who've experienced um, what has gone on at Collingwood, like Leon Davis, like Heritier Lumumba, there's no chance of the club being in a position to say that they're moving forward or whatever the cliche is these days. I, I suppose that's what I'm getting at. I mean, I think one of the dangers facing you now is that, is that a lot of the corporates, a lot of the clubs will try to institutionalise anti-racism. Like, for example, with the EPL, with the soccer in the UK, all the players take a knee before every game, which is great. They all wear no room for mm. racism badges, but every year there's 30,000 whatever you know, West African kids trafficked basically to Europe to play soccer on poverty wages that the parents have to pay 3,000 euro and no one says boo about that. While they're all wearing, like the corporates I'm mm. talking about, the Manchester United and the Liverpool and I love these clubs, you know, I love Manchester United and all the rest of it, but I just wonder whether now there's a danger that they'll just jump in and have institutionalised like nice safe anti-racism but a lot I, of, like, I don't, I don't we saw what happened in July last year with the ab Aboriginal players being told I, to have a bloody I don't think flu injection, the white players didn't, you know? I don't think there's a danger of it, I think it's happened. I mean, yeah. um, you know, the two key people on the committee set up to um, sort out the Collingwood thing are both employee or associated with Cooper. I mean, you know, uh, anyone who comes from the Aboriginal community knows that Cooper is one of those um, corporate bodies that has benefited enormously from the massive amounts of money that have been spent on Aboriginal, supposedly spent for the benefit of Aboriginal people in the last 20 or 30 years, you know. 20 years ago, I was, I was arguing that, you know, I was shocked that the annual um, uh, federal budget for Aboriginal affairs had reached something like almost a billion dollars. I mean, you know, it's chicken feed nowadays. I mean, the local Aboriginal health service here in Fitzroy, for the first 20 years of its operations, operated for uh, less than $200,000. For the first five years we, we ran, we had no government subsidy at all. Um, and, you know, in, we depended upon donations. And we were operating on about 25000 a year. Now, you know, corporate Australia have been the one among the primary beneficiaries from the vast amounts of Commonwealth's monies that have been spent in the last 40 years purportedly on Aboriginal welfare, uh, but the proof's in the pudding. You know, the statistics stay the same. The, the, the social indicators that show that Aboriginal people are by far still to this day the most deprived community in, you know, within the Australian society the health statistics are as just as pretty much the same as they were 40 years ago. The imprisonment rates are far worse than they were 40 years ago. You know, so despite all of this massive amounts of money that have been spent and the emergence and the deliberate development of an Aboriginal middle class, which is not something that existed at the time of the Aboriginal embassy, has meant that, um, you know, billions have been uh, wasted, pissed up against the wall, to the benefit of uh, major corporations, just about every, in every sector almost. Um, people have benefited from subsidies that supposedly were there to create op opportunities for Aborigines. The vast majority of Aboriginal people still live um, pretty close to the poverty line. I know this myself because most of my grandkids do, you know. Um, it's something that I, that we hadn't envisaged, you know, we were, when I was, we were young and idealistic, you know, we had a vision for the future, you know, and, and it worked well for a few years until government managed to stamp it out. Mm. Well, just, just going back to your open letter, was there any reason that Marcia Langton didn't sign it? Did you ask her, did she refuse to sign it? Or, I mean, she had an article in The Guardian the day before I saw. I mean, I can't say why any particular individual didn't sign it, but there were, there were a range of people who didn't sign it um, for a variety of different reasons. Some of them, you know, legitimate in my mind, others um, maybe not. But, you know, it doesn't matter who 
didn't sign it in the end anyway. It had the desired effect. It sure did, yeah. By the way, welcome to the Fitz, my favourite bar in, um, in Fitzroy. <laughs> I think the drinks are on you. I heard rumour that you got a bit of uh, some support for uh, Northland Secondary College for a project with Northland Secondary College, the struggle that you led in the yeah. 1990s. What's that about? Well, these days um, at Victoria University, I'm now a professor of history. <laughs> Um, which I find slightly amusing. Uh, but I, I went to university very late in life, uh, at almost the age of 50, uh, because I was, partly because I was disillusioned with the history that was being written about things that I had been part of some 20 years before, in the late 60s, early 70s. And so I studied history, um, but over the lifetime of my political activism I've always collected things. I haven't hoarded things but I've come close to it and uh, I finally put all of my collection together um, five or six years ago at Victoria University which is now it now comprises the greater part of the Aboriginal history archive that we've created there and I got a um, million dollar Australian Research Council grant a few years ago to uh, catalog index and digitize the entire collection with the view to putting it creating an on online free educational resource for you know legitimate uh, students of all types um, there's fantastic stuff in it but among the stuff in it um, is uh, material collected during various campaigns i've been involved in including the northlands campaign and um, so we made a special extra application for an Australian Research Council grant to uh, be able to tell the history of the Northland Secondary College uh, battle against the Kennett government in the early 1990s. And so we got another half a million dollars to do that. And that's now progressing brilliantly. So, I mean, just to go back to then, like Jeff Kennett, wins the election in October 1992, closes 350 schools, a handful, a small handful fight back. Richmond down here, uh, just down the road from where we are now, and obviously Northland, mm. which to most people is just a shopping centre, but there, was a, and there is a yeah. high school right next to it. Your son went there at the time, there was a large number of Indigenous students there, but it wasn't only Indigenous students, and you led sort of a multicultural, very working class school against the Kennett government. You occupied, you went to the Equal Opportunity Board, and you won. I mean, like, that's pretty friggin' amazing. It took us a long can you, time. Can you, can you talk us through, like, like how that well, panned out? When my middle son, his name is Bruce Nemeluk Malcolm X Foley, and with a name like that, he had to be. He had to be spirited. I got a phone. He was living with his mother in Sydney in uh, the late 1980s, and I got a call from her one day and she was um, perplexed, I think is a way to put it, because my son had just been deemed the most notorious truant in the history of the New South Wales education system, and she didn't know what to do. And I said, well, send him down here. He can come and live with me. And we got him down here, and he, I tried a range of alternative type schools. I didn't want to put him into the mainstream uh, sausage factory system because he obviously um, was reacting against that. I looked at a variety of alternative schools ranging from um, good to appalling but then eventually one day somebody I remembered actually that I'd been given a couple of lectures at Northlands and so I thought we'd try Northlands and almost instantly my son Loved it. Started going to school. I didn't have to pay him to go to school anymore. <laughs> I didn't have to try and bribe him. Um, and he started to perform. And one of the reasons for this was the unique program that existed in Northlands. As you said, Northlands was not, a, not a, um, an Aboriginal school. Aboriginal kids made up only 10% of the population. But it was a school where kids who were had problems coping in the mainstream, uh, with the mainstream expectations in the mainstream system, it was a place where they could go and um, be able to perform, you know. 
And one of the reasons why Northlands was uh, so good at uh, creating possibilities for so-called problem kids was the music and drama program that they had going there, you know, which was fantastic. You know, the kids would uh, come up with their own stories, uh, write them up, uh, produce, perform and film them, you know, and it was a remarkable school. And then one day, six months after my son starts uh, going there and loving going to school, um, I thought, you know, I was thinking, wow, at last, the, you know, I'm, he's, he's going to have a chance in life. And then along comes Jeff Kennett and closed down, you know, almost 300 schools doof, at the stroke of a pen, you know. And um, I wasn't the only, I realised that night that I wasn't the only parent who was outraged by this. They had a, an emergency meeting at Northland Secondary College and everybody, all the parents, all the staff, all the students were, were you know, in tears. And um, all sorts of people were making speeches. And I, I think I must have been the only person in the room who'd ever been involved in any sort of political campaigns in the past. And uh, somebody got me up on stage and I made some sort of stirring speech, I'm told, <laughs> which oh, stirred did. the amazing. troops up. Because I said to them, you know, I said, we can fight this. You know, this is, this is completely unjust. And it wasn't just Aboriginal kids that were affected by this. All the, all the uh, students in that school in various ways were, had had problems within the mainstream system. Northlands was, was the alternative to the to all the other schools that were out there, you know, and, and, it, and it, as it happened, the greater uh, part of the student body at Northlands were, were uh, non-Aboriginal, uh, e economically and socially deprived people, uh, mostly white working class kids, but also from a range of um, other uh, nationalities. But the one thing everyone had in common was um, everyone was from poor circumstances and um, working class origins, all of the white kids. And, and so I, I found myself for the first time in my life leading a campaign, you know, being the <laughs> spokesperson for a, uh, a crowd of people who were not Aboriginal, you know. This wasn't really an Aboriginal issue, but as luck would have it, um, we were able to challenge the closure uh, by arguing that the closure discriminated against the Aboriginal students because these students had nowhere else to go, as indeed none of the yeah. other students did, but for the purpose of the Education uh, the Equal Opportunity Board. Um, so my son, Bruce, and uh, Muthama Sinapan, another Aboriginal student, became two litigants. Uh, I represented my son, and we had, um, we had a great... Um, barrister, I think he was a barrister, I hope I'm not doing the injustice, a um, great barrister who volunteered to uh, do all the legal work and that was uh, Herman Borenstein. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about that later if you, tell me, if you remind me. I'll try and remember But uh, Herman, Herman Borenstein represented Muthama and so we went to the Equal Opportunity Board. Ask me what happened next. <laughs> yeah, break it up. I suppose, like today, a lot of young people see politics as social media pylons, you know, naming and shaming on Twitter and social media. Um, but this type of politics was very different. I mean, 350 schools closed. The only three that survived, Fitzroy, Richmond, Northland, yep. were the only three yep. where you occupied. Yet yeah, you did the EO case, mm. and I want to ask you about that mm. in more detail in a second. But we physically took command and possession of the three sites, which meant that the government couldn't just like empty it all out. And, and it wasn't just like a hollow campaign. We actually controlled the school sites. So that put us in with a mm. shot. And I just think for a lot of people today, this is like, you know, they're not used to that. Do you know what I mean? Most politics seems to be, as I say, just crapping on on social well, media, think, you know? Uh, the unfortunate impact of social media, I think, is that it's um, conditioned people into being placid. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and as you say... Um, it was very brave to do that. Like it, it was, oh. we, we all thought we were mad. Everyone else thought we were even madder oh. to take 
control of a friggin' school site yeah. and not let the Department of Education come in and empty it out. And it, but possession is nine tenths yep. of the rule. It puts you up with a huge. If you hadn't got control of that site, it would have been harder to win in the EL board. Mm -hmm. So, how did you run the EO case? Like, well, you know, um, we went to the Equal Opportunity Board, and and um, the first finding was in our favour. The Equal Opportunity Board, under the Equal Opportunity Commissioner Moira Rona, found in our favour and ordered Kenner to reopen the school. Um, so we thought we'd, we'd won. Technically we had, except the Kennett government then goes to a single Supreme Court judge, Justice Barry Beach, and um, appealed. The appeal was upheld. Barry Beach ordered the uh, thing back to the Equal Opportunity Board. In the meantime, Jeff Kennett had sacked Moira Rayner yep. and appointed his own Equal Opportunity Board Commissioner, who he clearly expected to Donald Trump style do yeah, his bidding, you know. Yeah. Um, however, she found in our favour as well. This is occurring over a two, three year period. She found in our favour. Again, the Kennett government um, appealed to a single Supreme Court judge, Justice Barry Beach. Again, Beach uh, upheld the Kennett uh, uh, appeal. And again, you know, it went backwards and forwards and eventually ended up before the full bench of the Supreme Court in Victoria. And we were sitting in the Supreme Court the day the decision was handed down. Uh, I was uh, doing the representation for my son throughout the Equal Opportunity Board hearings. When we got into the Supreme Court each time, Herman Borenstein and Ray Finkelstein took over. Um, and on the day we won in the full bench of the Supreme Court, I was sitting there expecting the worst and the judges are reading out their decision and I had a brain fart, heard that they'd found against us and I banged the table and I stormed out of the court, rapidly being pursued by Herman Borenstein saying, Gary, Gary, wait, we've won. <laughs> and I said, what? And no, uh, used to win it, but that was a are. really euphoric moment. But I, I just want to say one thing about our uh, legal representation during that. Throughout the Equal Opportunity Board hearings, we, I represented my son and Herman Borenstein represented Muthama. When we got to the Supreme Court, Herman Borenstein and Ray Finkelstein were our, our lawyers, but in the Equal Opportunity Board, Jeff Kennett's lawyer was a man called Mr. Kaka, who was a Palestinian. Yeah, I remember. You know, the irony. And yeah, I, yeah. I had, and i got to say, many, what, 20, 30 years later, um, I went and saw Mr. Kaka in his chambers in town and we made peace. I, you know, I knew that he was, he knew and I knew when we were in the Equal Opportunity Board, the, 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 the irony of the situation we were both in, you know, in terms of our representation. But... Um, the good thing I met Mr. Kaka, he made a significant contribution to the Palestinian Solidarity Conference, Black Solidarity Conference, a year or so ago. Good on you, Mr. Kaka. Like, it might be a stupid question, but like, you obviously had a Liberal Kennett government in Victoria, but at the time, Paul Keating was the Labor Prime Minister. Did you get any support, solidarity from Canberra? I want to. I want to. Indigenous working wanna, class pro Labor struggle? I want to tell the story of what happened in terms of the federal government. As you say, the federal government at the time was Labor. Not only that, the, um, the, at the time, at one point, the acting Prime Minister of Australia, Keating was off somewhere, the acting Prime Minister of Australia was Brian Howe, who was our local member. Federal member for your area. That, you know, represented where I lived, you know, even though I, well, won't go into me not vote. But, so I, and, not only that, Brian Howe, uh, some 20 years before, in 1974, had been the union rep at Swinburne College, which is where Bruce McGuinness and I, and a man called John Morrison, had been teaching, admittedly subversively, <laughs> a course at Never. Swinburne College, which produced uh, some of the, the best Aboriginal leaders in Victoria for the next 20, 30 years. Robbie Thorpe was one of our one of our star students, his sister Glenda was there. Yep. Uh, Lydia Thorpe's mother, Marge, was one of our, was there. 
you know. So back then, and when the Fraser government, because this was Commonwealth subsidised course we were running, and when the Fraser government found out what we were really up to, which was training cadres rather than sort of taking unemployable Aboriginal people and giving them basic skills to make them employable, which we thought we were doing, uh, but we were, we were basically training political cadres and Malcolm Fraser realised what we were doing and he tried to close us down. And um, one of our strongest supporters at Swinburne in 1970, well 1978 it was, was Brian Howe, you know, as, la as the union rep on campus. The and then he becomes acting prime minister. So fast forward 20 years, he's acting prime minister, I think, okay, because many, a significant number of the ch children, at the students at Northlands were in fact children of the Swinburne experiment yeah, yeah. back in the early 70s, you know. Um, uh, Robbie Thorpe's son was there, Archie Rhodes' son was there, um, you know, uh, my son was there. Uh, and so I naturally thought, Brian, you're the acting Prime Minister, come and visit in your, you know, in your electorate, uh, the school that's in this battle against a Liberal government in Victoria. Brian Howe pulled me aside and he said to me, Gary, um, I've got to uh, give you a word of advice, mate. I said, oh yeah, what's that? He said, mate, there's no way you're going to win this. You can't win. It's impossible. I said, mate, see that door? Walk that way through it and never darken our doorstep again, you dog. Yeah. I mean, the federal Labor government was too gutless to back us in our struggle against Northerners. We got no support from the federal Labor government. They were dogs. Yeah. In fact, I probably despise um, members of the Hawke government more than I do members of the Kennett government, except for Jeff, the two Jeffs, Jeff Kennett and Jeff Spring. Remember Jeff, oh, Jeff Spring? Toad. I mean, Jeff Spring Literally, was... Literally, he looked like a toad, he was a toad. And he was the person who was sent in to deliberately uh, do both your, the Richmond over yeah. and, and all of us over. So, just a little bit deeper into that campaign, I mean, you guys outreached, I mean, you did some great stunts. I remember when you took the kids to Scotch College, which was the premier of Kennett's old school. What happened there? Well, Jeff Kennett had gone on television, this is halfway through the three-year battle, and he said on television, oh, these kids can go to any school, you know, what are they whinging about, sort of thing, you know, to paraphrase. And so I pulled our crew together and said, well, Jeff Kennett reckons we can go to, go to any school anywhere. Let's go to Jeff Kennett's old school, Scots College. And they all said, oh yeah. And so I rang up the um, headmaster at Scots College and I said to him, my name's Gary Foley, you know who I am? He said, yes, I know who you are. I said, listen mate, I'm gonna bring a bunch of my students over to enrol in your school. And he said, oh, <laughs> you know, is there any way we can avoid this? I said, settle down. I said, we're going to come there, it's a media stunt, okay? I said, I don't want my kids running around in your, your college any more than you do, you know? <laughs> I said, but if you Pick just stay habits. calm, don't call the cops, we'll come, we'll have our little thing at your front gate, and the TV cameras there, that we'll do our thing and we'll go, okay? And he said, oh, is there anything I can do to avoid this? I said, well, yes, there is one, something you can do. And he said, what's that? I said, tell Jeff Kennett, tell your ex-student Jeff Kennett to reopen our school. And he said to me, he said, can you give me 15 minutes? And I said, what, are you going to ring up Jeff Kennett? He said, yes. I said, okay, I'll give you 15 minutes. <laughs> and 15 minutes he rang back. He said, oh, I couldn't get on to Jeff, you know, is there any way to avoid it? I said, no, it's going to happen. Just, he had a crack anyway. I said, just relax and don't do anything silly. And so we get our kids in the bus and we head off to Scott's College. And we get to Scotch College and the headmaster's put a little wooden barrier across the front, which worked perfectly, it looked good on TV coverage that night. And I brought our kids there and I lined them all up against this barrier and I said, look at this, see this? I said, this is where the bloke who closed your school down, this is where he went to school. And they said, oh, this is bigger than our suburb. I said, that's right. And when, when that happened, I realised I, I was silly that it hadn't realised before. I realised that most of these kids, working class and blacks and 
migrants in it had never been to Turak. I said, yeah, you yeah. people ever been to Turak? They said, no. I said, okay, bus driver, take us to Turak. We'll, we'll do a little tour. I said, I'll show you how the other half live. And that was a major revelation for a lot of these kids, you know. They, it blew their minds. Here were people living in houses that were bigger than their school. Yeah. You know? And you could read a hundred books and not pick that up, yeah. but through struggle, and they, so they learned out, those things. It yeah. turned out to be a really uh, positive exercise, both in terms of raising the students' awareness of what was on the other side of the river, uh, but also, you know, that was a sort. Of, I knew that that was a sort of stunt that television, oh, they loved it. News, yeah. love, you know, it's you, you perfect. Said, you said in yeah. passing that you didn't vote, but you did stand in the federal election in March 1993. I remember. First time we met, actually, I was trying to talk oh, into yeah. it. I was sent up by the Richmond. We decided to send Alvi, the yeah. leader of our campaign, at, at the federal seat down there. And then you stood. Mm. I, I couldn't believe it because I was told this guy is the most famous anarchist in the world. If you can get him to stand in the federal election, but you ended up standing. And what I was stood, that about? I mean, I, I think you were the first candidate that never voted before that stood in an election. And I, I'm still, I never was, never will be, and am still not now on the Australian electoral roll, you know. But at the time, um, but you're on, the, you're on the ballot form. But yeah, but yeah. yeah, absolutely. I got seven, more than 700 votes, you know. <laughs> but anyway, how that happened, the federal government was setting up this new shonky body called ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. We used to call it Aborigines Talking Shit in Canberra. <laughs> but they set up this dodgy body, and in order to be a candidate or in order to vote in the election for... Uh, Aboriginal representatives. Aboriginal people all over Australia supposedly were able to vote, but the condition was that you couldn't vote and you could not be a candidate unless you were on the Australian electoral roll. And I said, well, I'm not on the Australian electoral roll, and at the time, you could stand for federal parliament. You could become, a, as you said, my name's on the ballot paper. And in order to prove a point, to show that was possible for me to stand for the Australian Parliament, but not for my own Aboriginal representative body. I said, I'll show you, I'll stand for Parliament. And I stood for Parliament. Um, I didn't spend one cent in campaign funds. I never left my house. And I still got <laughs> 700 votes. <laughs> Jesus, you might be onto something then. But I mean, I, I made the point, but not that anybody took any notice, but it was trying to show that the ATSIC, when it was set up, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, was not a, a truly representative body because it excluded a significant number of the a, Aboriginal populace. And at the time, close to the majority of the Aboriginal population still would not have been on the electoral roll. Yeah. You know? I just think that like, looking back, there's so few victories for those of us on this side of the fence um, that when you're up against a government like the Kenner government, like two wins, out and out wins, were the Richmond occupation and your struggle at Northland. And I just think people need to look at it and study it for obvious reasons. I mean, with this money that you've got, this grant that you've got, is, well, is it going to be some type of musical or a movie or something about the, the, this struggle? What, what, what's what's well, it all about? We got this half million dollar grant from the Australian Research Council. You know, this is part of the advantage of being a professor of history. Um, and so as luck would have it, uh, we managed to track down and bring together a whole group of former students at Swinburne from the, oh, there's a faux pas. We managed to bring together a whole group of former Northland students. Um, and I said, I, I said to them, now listen you mob, I want you to talk amongst yourselves. I want you to record your memories, you know, uh, as a group. And I want you to come up with your perception and understanding of what it all meant and how it affected you and all the rest of it. And uh, then later down the track, because I also decided that what we'd do, we'd, we'd write a proper serious history book, like your book on uh, Richmond. Um, the book would be written by myself and um, Moira Rayner, um, that uh, because so much artwork came out of then, and since we've assembled this new group again together, uh, we're going to hold an exhibition, of, uh, which is sort of a history. Uh, hopefully, I think it's going to be on at the Melbourne Museum at Bunjalaka. Um, but I also said to them, I said, there's also something else. This is the group of former students. And also we managed to 
f bring together the former drama student uh, teacher mm. and a lot of the former teachers and some of the surviving community members who are in the original battle, pull them all together and I said, how about this as an alternative way of telling history? I said, remember that one of the strengths of Northlands that made it so meaningful for so many kids was the mu music and drama program. I said, why don't you assemble your stories and create a musical drama, a stage musical. Um, tell the story of the Northlands battle that way. I said to him, you've got the perfect villain, Jeff Kennett, you know. I said, and you've got the perfect hero, heroes. I will said, you mob are the heroes. And I said, you've got all this talent. Archie Roach, is, uh, Archie Roach wrote uh, some songs for the battle when we were confronting Kennett. Uh, I said, Archie Roach is, and Archie Roach's son is involved in this project. You've got musicians. You've got, um, I'm roped in at Ilbidgeri Theatre Company, the longest and best uh, Aboriginal theatre production company in Australia, here in Melbourne. Um, I've approached them about the possibility of them of assisting in the, the production because they're in a position to pluck the monies that will be required to bung it on in a future Melbourne festival, which is my ambition for it at the moment. And hopefully it'll be in a future Melbourne festival when Jeff Kennett is still alive. We'll invite him to the opening night. Mm. Just, to, just to go through it in chronological order, you had the 1967 referendum. You, you, you described oh, it as the well, most important was... referendum in Australian history. And you also said you'd never get 90% again after Hansen. No, what, what did you mean by that? Like, just for, for, well, for, for those who don't know, what, what was the referendum about? The Why was it 90%? Why would we not get that today? The extraordinary thing about the 1967 referendum was that it was held um, at a time when the official Australian government policy on Aboriginal, Aboriginal people was um, assimilation, which assimilation equals genocide. The desired end result of a policy of assimilation is that there be no Aborigines. And yet, um, in excess of 90% of the Australian voting public voted yes to a question that they had put to them as meaning, put to them by Aboriginal um, ad advocates at the time, had put to them as meaning, do you believe in justice for Aboriginal people, yes or no? More than 90% of the Australian people. It's one of the first times Australian people had ever voted yes in a, in a federal referendum. And it's by far, to this day, uh. the biggest yes vote ever in the history of all Australian referendums. And I mean, what happened subsequent to that, I mean, you know, I say the referendum was a failure because the um, uh, federal government sat on its hands. The federal government chose to ignore the expressed wishes of the overwhelming majority of Aboriginal people, uh, of Australian people, uh, to do something about the situation of Aboriginal people. Um, the federal government sat on its hands, the New South Wales government in a huff uh, said, oh, you don't want us looking after the Abos? They closed down the old apartheid system in New South Wales, which resulted in a mass exodus of Aboriginal people from the rural areas into Sydney which created Redfern as the big suburb it was. I mean, the, it was the biggest Aboriginal community in the history of Australia in 19, by 1969, you know, which was where I was living. And it was an extraordinary place. You had people from many different nations, uh, but all perceiving the, what was happening to them in Redfern as a, you know, a common thing. The police brutality, the police harassment, the, um, you know, the blatant racism and out of that grew the black power movement folks. <laughs> I mean it went from 1500 people to 35,000 people in Redfern apparently. And That's in the time I, I arrived in That's Sydney. That's a huge overnight increase. I arrived much. in Sydney as a wet behind the ears, green, <laughs> black, green. Uh, Politically green. Green right? in the gills yeah. sort of yeah. uh, young kid, 17 years old in 1967 and at the beginning of 1967 and um, at the time the Aboriginal population of Redfern was about 1,500 people but by 1969, just two years later, there were 35,000 people there 
And the one thing everybody, I always say, the one thing that everybody had in common then was poverty. Um, there was no black middle class, mm. you know. You were middle class if maybe if you owned a suit, <laughs> which none of us did. And, and, and the Vietnam War was going on. So a lot oh, of Vietnam American time. troops were coming for R&R &R to Sydney and hey, you I were mixed, like some of the black troops would make contact with indigenous Redfern well, I mean, and that must have politically influenced you guys. Well, you guys it certainly did. I mean, I, my introduction to Sydney, because I grew up in, in, the, in the bush, uh, in little country towns. I arrive in Sydney, I'm naive, I'm green, I'm, you know, no nothing. Um, my introduction to Sydney was a bashing by members of the 21 Division, a notorious police squad in Sydney at the time, in a notorious police force, notorious for their corruption. But I got a bashing and a couple of days later I met a guy called Paul Coe. I talked to him about this bashing I just got and he handed me a book. He said, read this. And it was the autobiography of Malcolm X. And it was, it was that. And it was that. Those two things, the Bashan and autobiography of Malcolm X that set me on the path that led me to today. But at the time, after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, I mean, I was already sort of more or less aware of some, some of the stuff that had been going on in America. But that piqued my interest in what was going on there. And we subsequently read, started reading stuff like Bobby Seale's Seize the Time about the history of the Black Panthers, or about the, what the Black Panthers were doing. And then suddenly, this, all these American soldiers started turning up in Sydney. Uh, the American military had been, had decided Not just that, to talk politics, I'm sure. Like, I mean, well, I had mean, some good marijuana, I'd imagine. Well, I mean, you know, the Australian government, I mean, the American military had been looking for somewhere safe for their yeah, yeah. troops in Vietnam to go in the neighbourhood where they wouldn't get shot up or bombed or something. And Sydney was apparently the safest place. So suddenly Sydney's full of these American troops, cashed up, looking, you know, for whatever cashed up American troops look for. But we found that... Um, a significant number of those troops were African American from the ghettos. You know, yeah, yeah. this it was. It pretty soon became clear that the American military was using poor blacks as cannon fodder in the Vietnam War, and a lot of uh, working class poor whites as well. But these African Americans who were arriving in Sydney said, "Hey, where is the black community? There was no black community except us." And remember also that this is still in the days of the White Australia policy still in force. So the only black community in Sydney was us in Redfern. And so a lot of these guys started gravitating towards us and hanging around with us. And as I've said in other places, they bought interesting things with them. They bought really good weed, um, but they also were bought um, uh, African-American political literature, but more importantly, first-hand accounts of what was going on back home in their communities yeah, yeah. where they came from. And so that, that enhanced incredibly our understanding of what was going on, particularly in places um, like Oakland in California, the, where the Panthers were running um, uh, breakfast programs and, and, legal and legal aid and uh, health clinics and stuff like that. And that's the stuff that really grabbed us about what was going on in America, the, what the Panthers were doing. Because we saw in Redfern... When we read about what was going on in Oakland, Calif Oakland California, in, in um, Harlem and other places, uh, we could relate to that because they were talking about the same situation, especially in Oakland, a big black community that's in largely on the poverty line, subjected to intense uh, police brutality and harassment. We said, that's us, that's how, that's what's happening to us. And so it's very easy for us to relate uh, our experience to their experience and then start to look at what they had done um, in the way of measures to either counter or alleviate the same situations we were experiencing. And that's where we got the idea to set up a pig patrol in Redfern. <laughs> so you'd p follow the police around? Well, I mean, in, in Oakland, what the Panthers had done because of uh, a loophole in the law in California, 
they were able to carry weapons, you know, as long as they, under certain conditions, as long as they were not concealed and as long as while they were in a car they weren't loaded. And so the Panthers set up a system whereby when a police car came into the Oakland black community, California, the Panthers, a bunch of Panthers would drive, fo follow that car with their cun guns on the, on the dashboard um, so they could be seen. And if the police car stopped and the police person got out, the Panthers would stop behind them and they'd get out and they'd load their guns, their pump action shotguns, and they'd say, we're here to defend the black community. You kill any of our people and we'll kill you. Um, that's one of the reasons why not a lot of Panthers survived those days. But back in Redfern, Paul Coe thought that was a great idea. He, <laughs> he was a law student at the time. He, uh, he searched through the law books in New South Wales, didn't find the similar loophole, mercifully. <laughs> I've often said, you know, had he have found a loophole, then maybe I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. But we thought, nevertheless thought the idea of uh, uh, monitoring the police, a pig patrol, you know, uh, monitoring what the police were doing and collecting information on their activities exactly. And that's how a small group, Myself, Paul Coe, Gary Williams, I think Billy Craigie and his sister Lynn Thompson went to the roughest, toughest pub in Sydney in Redfern at the time, the Empress Hotel, which was the main Aboriginal meeting place. We went there one Saturday night armed with uh, pencils and notebooks. <laughs> <laughs> and we started recording what the coppers were up to. Now you've got to remember this is, this is at the time, this is pretty much at the time when Roger Rogerson was doing his uh, training in 21 Division. And the 21 Division had That's been... That's where he started, 21 Division. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The 21 Division had been sent into Reven, Redfern from what we could figure out to placate the blacks or keep the blacks under control. Or more precisely, our little group, so-called black power people. And so... We had um, many encounters with 21 Division. They were brutal. Um, once we started collecting information about what the police were doing, um, the more astute uh, police persons amongst them noticed what we were doing. And uh, so then they started paying particular attention to us. But we still managed to gather enough information to, to cut a long story short, to ultimately create the first free shop front legal aid centre in Australia. The Redfern Aboriginal, Medical, uh, Aboriginal Legal Service, you know, which was based um, a fair bit on the model of what the Panthers had done in America without the guns. Um, but it was what we call a community survival program. It was uh, our broader aim at that point was land rights, which we saw as a means towards political and economic independence for Aboriginal people, but we knew that wasn't going to happen for a long time. And so in order to make sure that our community survived, to take advantage of the land rights if ever we got them, you needed these programs to alleviate the immediate problems, you know, which was uh, pretty much what the, were doing. the argument of what the Panthers were yeah. saying, uh, you know, when they talk about communities. So the legal service, we said it was a community survival program, but more importantly, it was an organisation that had been, had the initiative, had, the initiative had come from the community and um, the idea was developed by people within the community and in the end when the organisation was established, the majority of people on the board of directors were Aboriginal people from that community who'd been elected by that community. So it was what we call a community controlled community survival program, you know, and um, it, it had an immediate impact. I want to talk to you about the politics of it because back then, okay. black power, black consciousness, in South Africa, there was a revival of the anti apartheid struggle back in the early 70s, Steve Biko, black consciousness, um, and that evolved over time into sort of the ANC and the trade union movement and sort of a more class socialist sort of direction. Although what happened later is another mm. story, um, but leaving that aside. And back in the day then, you argued for um, 
to, to develop sufficient economic independence to be able to secede from Australia. I mean, how did you think that was going to work? What was the plan there? And that's not what you would say today, is it? I mean, oh, I don't know. I mean, or, or is it? Yeah. I still argue. I mean, you know, in the 1980s, in the 1980s, I was, um, I did a lot of work in Pigeon Jarrah country in the top end of uh, South Australia, in Central Australia. And I was, <laughs> I was uh, uh, talking then to certain Pigeon Jarrah people about uh, the possibility of them because the, the Dunstan government had actually given uh, pretty much free old title to 10% of the state. They're in the top northwest corner to the Pitjantara homelands, peoples. And I used to say to them, you mob are in the perfect position to secede from Australia, you know. Uh, establish diplomatic relations with countries around you, such as Australia, you know, and beyond. Um, and create, I mean, you know, in a... <laughs> I mean, I said there's, you could get international aid to, I mean, not, the truth is I, I said to them, you could create, you could become economically independent by creating a Nyandi based economy. You know, you're no longer, you're no longer subject to the laws of Australia, you're subject to your own laws. And so you can grow these massive marijuana farms and ship it across the border and you become economically independent in no time. But the basic idea of them being in a position to, if they wanted to, um, uh, secede and seek uh, United Nations status as an independent nation was absolutely feasible. I mean, at the time and now, you've got this little tiny speck out there in the Pacific called Nauru, you know, which is basically uh, a bit of dirt with a road on it going around this big hole in the ground. I've been to Nauru, you know. Uh, I've seen Nauru. Nauru is accepted as a nation. It's acknowledged and recognised. It's got nation status. The majority of Nauruans live in Melbourne. You know, there's more Pijinjara people than there are Nauruans. Mm. So why not uh, the Pijinjara people having their own independent state? Uh, then in a position to negotiate with other nation states for, you know, um, um, what do you call it, uh, aid, mm. and all sorts of stuff. And they I, could I just wonder though, like say, say for example, Melbourne 2021, you got still a significant indigenous population on the public housing estates, you got indigenous yeah, but graduates these, working. These ideas I'm talking about were feasible and possible uh, 40 years ago, and for, I still think they're feasible and possible in certain parts of Australia. Yeah, okay. But in a place like Melbourne, um, um, it's a bit more difficult, you know. So, so, mean, so to, to pe pe the word treaty is used a lot nowadays. Um, what does it actually mean? You know, I, I'll get building workers come up to me go, oh, your mates are banging on about a treaty, what, what, you know, and they, they think they're going to lose their bloody swimming pools and all the rest of it. What exactly does a treaty mean concretely for Australia from your perspective? From my perspective, there's not a single treaty in the history of, of colonialism that's ever been signed with a colonised people that's ever um, been to the benefit of the colonised people. I mean, treaties, treaty, I mean, the only treaty, let me correct myself, the only treaty that in the world that was ever um, um, a strong treaty was the Treaty of Waitangi. But the Treaty of Waitangi was signed after the Maori people had, had fought the British military to a standstill. So the Treaty of Waitangi was signed from a position of strength by the Maori people. And yet, for 150 years after the signing of the treaty, successive New Zealand governments took absolutely no notice of it, you know, to the, to the inevitable detriment of the, the Maori peoples who'd lived during that time, you know. Um, treaties, treaties, in my opinion, aren't worth the paper they're written on. And if there are people out there in, in Australia who fear um, the signing of some sort of treaty, I'd say, have no fear. <laughs> Your government will look after you. 
they'll ensure that these blackfellas get nothing, which has been the history right up until now. So, so this movement, um, which I guess Richard speak with the um, Aboriginal Ten Embassy, I mean, I think that's, you, you'd agree with that. Just, just briefly on that, like, how did that come about? And why did you think that was so important? Well, at the peak, and why do you think that was the peak of the movement? At, the 1972 the Aboriginal Embassy, the Aboriginal Embassy to me, to me the Aboriginal Embassy is something, an entity that existed between the 26th of January 1972 and the 30th of July 1972. It's significant in Australian history because it actually changed the course of Australian history, but how it came about was purely by accident. I mean, um, throughout 1971, um, the federal government was getting more and more nervous as mm. Aboriginal land rights demonstrations that we were organising in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, mainly, uh, were getting bigger and bigger, especially after the 1971 Springbok tour, the anti-apartheid movement then joined forces with us and, and large numbers of people from the anti-apartheid movement started joining the Aboriginal land rights marches, uh, which we, we had challenged them to do. And so sitting in Canberra was this uh, hapless, tragic, pathetic little figure uh, called Billy McMahon, who just so happened to be the Prime Minister of Australia. Billy McMahon was uh, an interesting character politically. He was vertically challenged. Um, he had a squeaky voice. And um, up against him in Parliament was Gough Whitlam. Gough Whitlam was about seven foot tall with a booming voice. And Billy McMahon was this tragic little <laughs> tiny guy with a squeaky voice who cartoonists had a field day with, you know. And so Billy McMahon was getting more and more nervous throughout 1971 with the publicity of these big land rights, Aboriginal land rights marches were gaining to the extent we were starting to get uh, a lot of coverage overseas as well. And the Australian government, Billy McMahon more particularly, was getting nervous. So he decided that his, sol his um, solution to what he saw as his problem then was to, for him as Prime Minister, to make a major policy statement on Aboriginal land rights. Um, in keeping with the hapless nature of his administration, he decided to make this statement on, on Australia Day, Invasion Day, 26th of January 1972. I mean, yeah, that in itself is a fairly stupid move, unless you're going to come out and say, oh, Abri we're giving our Australia back to the Aboriginal people. But Billy McMahon chose the most sensitive day in the annual political calendar for Aboriginal people, Invasion Day. He makes his statement which says, in effect, my government will never grant Aboriginals land rights. So half of the Black Power movement at the time was in Brisbane that weekend at a big uh, anti-racism conference that we took over. But those who were still in Redfern gathered together and said, we've got to respond to this. And Chicka Dixon, the legendary Aboriginal political activist, one of my mentors, um, ex Warfy, uh, that's where he said he learned his politics. Um, he was the leader of the first Aboriginal deputation of China. Chicka Dixon had all these suggestions on the night of the 26th, on the day of the 26th. He said, Why don't we take over uh, Pinchgut in Sydney Harbour, Fort Denison, you know, like the, like the Native Americans had just done um, a couple of years before in. Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay. And everyone thought that was a great idea except for one thing. Nobody, none, none of the great big brave black power men assembled that night were game to row a boat through <laughs> shark infested waters into the middle of Sydney Harbour. So they had to think of an alternative. So they decided to send four guys to Canberra. And the basic idea was was simply to go set up a little protest that arranged for a photographer from the Canberra newspaper to be there to take a photo uh, with the idea that the next morning when Billy McMahon woke up at the lodge, he'd open up his local newspaper and there on the front page would be blackfellas protesting on his lawn of his parliament house. So they get to Canberra. The, I mean, the idea was go to Canberra, 
hold out long enough, set up a protest, hold out long enough to get your photo taken. The cops will come, they'll arrest you, spend the night in the cells, we'll come down and bail you out the, tomorrow sort of thing. So off they went. They got there, set up their protest, photo got taken, cops came. The plan was all going to perfection, except the police, the ACT police, as they were called at the time, didn't stick to the script. Instead, they told the guys, uh, sorry boys, there doesn't seem to be a law against camping on the lawns of Parliament House. <laughs> and the boys said, what? And Copper said, well, you know, uh, there's no law against camping on the lawns of Parliament House. And the boy said, yay. And he said, but, and they said, but what? And as long as you only put 11 tenths on this lawn, you've got 11 tenths or less, nothing we can do. Copper got in his car, drove away. The boys had found a loophole in Canberra law. You know, it was extraordinary. I mean, you, you couldn't write about this. Oh yeah. And so almost immediately, the, this new Aboriginal embassy had been called the Aboriginal embassy by Tony Curry, one of the four guys who went that night. He was the poet of the Black Power movement. He said, the Prime Minister's statement has deemed us aliens in our own land. If we're aliens in our own land, we'll have an embassy like all the other aliens, you know? And uh, so our embassy... And our Whitlam, embassy, Whitlam came. Whitlam, well, this is why the embassy changed the course of Australian history. You know, Whitlam, at one point we had, they, we had a little meeting out the front of the embassy. We had this little miniature stage and these microphones and a good PA, all these people making speeches. And Whitlam comes across and starts making this grand speech. Don't worry all you Aboriginal people. Uh, there's an election on in December. Uh, all you've got to do is vote for the ALP and everything will be sweet. Or words to that effect. And in the middle of that speech, he got challenged by Paul Coe. And I've actually got a photograph of this moment. Paul Coe challenged, stood up and he said, hang on, Mr Whitlam. He said, the government across the road of Billy McMahon, their policy is, is uh, assimilation for Aborigines. He said, your party, the Labor Party's policy on Aborigines is assimilation. It's been that way virtually since Federation. He said, Mr Whitlam, you know that assimilation equals genocide. Now, Gough Whitlam could have, you know, told Coe to go and get stuff, but he didn't. Whitlam took, it on, took Coe's position on board and as a result, within days, announced a major policy change on the part of the Labor government. It was no longer assimilation for Aborigines. They were in now opposition at the time. Were they? they were in opposition at the time? Yes. Yes. This yes. is six months before he got yes. elected. Yes. You know? So he came out and he said, and he said in his 1972 um, uh, campaign speech, my government will deliver land rights to Aboriginal people. Not because, <laughs> but because all of us are diminished whilst the Aboriginal people do not have their place their rightful place in this nation. That's what he said. It does a pretty good <laughs> invitation too. And that is the moment that represents the end of the era of assimilation. That was the first time since Australia became Australia, since Federation, that there was no longer a bipartisan policy of assimilation for Aborigines. But I, I got the two... Whitlam, when he became Prime Minister, um, it was good for the first six months. He set up the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. He started doing all the right things. But when it came to his promise to deliver national uniform land rights legislation, he hit a hitch with uh, the Premier of Western Australia, Charles Court, Joe B. Jockey Peterson in Queensland, um, resisting. And re he had the power after the 1967 referendum to override the states. Uh, but Whitlam was in the process um, of him and Lance Barnard trying to imp implement a thousand reforms at once. I mean that first six months of the Whitlam government was pretty extraordinary and I think he took his eye off the ball and he decided that it was easier to just give land rights to those where the Commonwealth had jurisdiction which meant a small group of people in the Northern Territory. Uh, the Northern Territory Land Rights Act uh, 
is the only piece of legislation in Australia that's ever given Aboriginal people land rights. But the promise Whitlam had made was that legislation would be national. Mm -hmm. And so he reneged. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is a pity because, you know. So, so that, that whole movement, like, it's so extraordinary, but it was ultimately defeated. And, you know, I just. It wasn't defeated, it was. Well, say, just say, take, take Redfern. People talk about conspiracy theories a lot nowadays, but the way they wrecked Redfern, the, the New South Wales state government, and they moved Indigenous people out to Mount well, Druitt and let Parramatta me, and... Let me put it another way. The, the well, it was a conscious policy, the, surely. The, the Aboriginal embassy scared the shit out of the state government in New South Wales and the federal government because they suddenly realised the power that Aboriginal people were able to show. Yep. And I mean, it was, our power was largely imaginary. We were, we were master manipulators of the mainstream media at the time, and the mainstream media then was a lot different than it is now. And um, we were able to pull large people onto the streets, which scared the hell out of governments at the time. And we also had the advantage of, you know, the uh, anti-Vietnam War movement had been a huge thing and we were able to tap into that, we were able to tap into the anti-apartheid movement, and we had gained strength so that the Aboriginal Embassy uh, showed what we were capable of in terms of forcing, um, you know, government policy change. But um, then when Whitlam got in, the other effect of Whitlam getting in, um, he set up the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. The first time there was a federal government department fully fledged government department responsible for Aborigines. Recruited Charlie Perkins. Charlie Perkins' task was to identify and recruit as many of the talented Aboriginal people out there into the department. Because once you get an Aboriginal person in the public service, they've got to sign the Public Service Act, which yep. zips their lips. And so, they not only managed to neutralise the next next um, wa wave of leadership by getting them incorporating them into the public service and shutting them up and giving them big salaries and creating the most important effect of that was the this was the beginning of the creation of a black middle class which had been absent up until that moment in history. And I would argue that today, the black middle class are as great a problem as anything else that the Aboriginal community confronts. In the same way as the black middle class in Ameri uh, African American in African American situation mm -hmm. has sort of been the buffer zone between the 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 ruling class and the establishment and the fucking and the shit kickers, mm -hmm. you know, and they serve as that buffer to. And I mean, we see this all the time. The Collingwood Football Club exercise is a classic example of how you can um, enlist and in, uh, the back black middle class to help you uh, suppress a particular problem, in this instance racism, without really resolving it and without really getting to the root cause and getting at that, you know, you just paper it over, paper over the cracks, band-aids, and, uh, you know, the black middle class go away with a big pay packet, and the shit kickers stay where they were. So just on a related issue, like, so back in the day, Fitzroy, where we are right now, um, massive indigenous population, Gertrude Street was the, the hub, really, probably, of indigenous activism back in the day, Redfern, the same in Sydney, and they've been depopulated, mm. here, mainly through gentrification, to be fair, but up in Sydney, it was more of like a conscious, seemed to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, a conscious policy to move people out to public housing estates out in the Sydney suburbs. Um, uh, you're not wrong. I mean, the, that is the essential difference between the two communities. I mean, as you say, there was a big, when I first came to Fitzroy, there was a big Aboriginal community. Uh, and I just left a, an Aboriginal community of 30,000 in, in Redfern. Um, what happened in New South Wales was that after the Aboriginal Embassy, the state government there got such a shock that that whole uh, embassy exercise and 
the whole international publicity that came out of that and the whole effect of changing um, federal government policy freaked the, the idea that there was this huge black radical mass or what they thought was a huge black radical mass right in inner city Sydney scared the state government so much that they then introduced a new uh, policy in the state uh, housing um, commission as it was called then, uh, a policy um, that said that Aboriginal people applying for public housing from in the Redfern community were not to be housed in the Redfern uh, housing and Waterloo housing estates in the inner city, but they were to be housed out in the, the new emerging uh, western suburb wastelands um, of public housing estates. Campbelltown, Outro, and, places. Yeah. yeah and more that they were not, the policy was to be one family per street. In other words, this yes. was the re-emergence or a re-continuation of the policy of assimilation, only much more explicit than it had been before. And that's what broke Redfern up. That's why you go to Redfern now, there's hardly anyone left, yeah. you know? and. Um, here it's slightly different. When, when I got elected first in 2004, 20% of people in this area were in public housing. Mm. Now it's 10%. And the number of public housing units mm. hasn't dropped. It's just that so many new expensive yuppie apartments have moved in. It's just diluted. And well, any, no, no new person... I you, think that's the difference between um, Redfern and uh, Fitzroy. I mean, now I, watched, I watched the fucking gentrification. When I first came to, Redfern, uh, to Fitzroy, like I say, this was... A, to me, this was the Aboriginal suburb of Melbourne. Gertrude Street was the Black Street of Melbourne. Yeah. Ali and, came here when he came yeah. to visit, yeah. And, um, to, to Gertrude you know, Street. And even I got forced out of um, Fitzroy by gentrification, you know? And this was at a time when I, I think this was close to when I was starting to earn a professor's salary, you know? I'm on a foreman's job at last. <laughs> it's just not enough for Fitzroy nowadays, man. But, That's um, right. Just a difference a bit, of, again, I just want to come back to this question of politics today versus politics back then. Back in the day, I mean, you've spoken about how the unions, the Communist Party, and, and I guess a lot of rank and file Labour Party members were good, you know, they were in solidarity often with the Indigenous community, going back to 47 Pilbara and, you know... Well, in um, the early 70s was still a time when uh, the union movement was really strong before fucking Bob Walker and his mates fucked it up. Um, you know, the union movement uh, were... Let me start again. Certain sections of the union movement were really staunch supporters. I mean, you got a, I mean, the, the Shearers Union back in the 30s and 40s where a lot of people like Bill Annis and others uh, learnt their politics. Um, uh, old George Rose from Walgett and, you know, some of the great Aboriginal uh, leaders of the 40s, 50s. Uh, old Joe McGuinness from Cairns. Um, there are numerous Aboriginal leaders who were, uh, not only um, learnt their politics but who were strongly supported by the trade union movement, you know. Right and the BLF the in the 70s. Yeah. I mean, the BLF in, the BLF in Sydney, <laughs> I mean, this was my big problem when I came to Melbourne. <laughs> I'd been a big supporter of, you know, I'd been, you know, uh, the BLF in Sydney uh, had been the staunchest along with the, the Wharfies and the Siemens Union and the Liquor Trades Union, they were our staunchest supporters in the New South Wales Labor, Trades and Labor Council up there in the early 70s. Um, uh, to the extent where the only person who I think ever went to jail for the Aboriginal Embassy demonstrations was a white builder's labourer from the New South Wales Builders Labourers Federation. Bob Pringle and, and, and Joey Owens in particular, and to a lesser extent Jack Mundy, um, were not only staunch political supporters of ours, they become really close, um, strong friends of ours, you know. Um, and when what happened to them and their leadership in New South Wales, I think that that was um, that had a very destructive effect in the long term. On but the intervention by the Gallagher forces from Victoria into New South indeed. Wales. Yeah, yeah. And I did say that. I had a few problems when I came oh, to I can Melbourne. Imagine. 
Uh, because uh, my Aboriginal comrades down here and my number one mentor down here were staunch Gallagher supporters, so we had to agree to disagree, but I never let them get away with um, ever um, um, criticising or diminishing what uh, the New South Wales BLF had done in their support, you know, for the Black Power movement. I mean, uh, Bobby Pringle, Bobby Pringle got arrested in Redfern, you know. He, he, they sent their membership into Redfern to support us when the coppers were bashing us. And Bobby Pringle got arrested with us trying to fight the coppers and trying to, you know. And the, 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 this is my question because today you say the wrong word, you're taken up. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Up but to a point. Up to a point. But I mean, back then, if you spoke to, if you went back in a time machine, you spoke to any rank and file Communist Party member, Labour Party yeah. member, Unionist, the casual racism was probably a lot worse yeah. than it is today where everyone says all the right words. But mate, they're not going to help you. But then, the, What do the unions, the Labour Party do much now, most of them, to support but, Indigenous people unlike back then, even I though agree. they're all saying the right words and, and Sport but, Invasion Day and all that. But you know? at the end of the day, if you look over a long term of history, um, it's always been certain small groups of individuals or certain individuals within the left and the trade union movement who, whose commitment and, and ability to mobilise others that have been a key factor in all this. I mean, it's important that people know and understand that the strongest um, policy ever uh, uh, on Aboriginal rights that ever existed in Australia, and that, that's a, this is a policy that was even stronger than we had in the Black Power Move, the strongest policy in support of Aboriginal people ever was in 1934 in the Communist Party, when uh, they, were, they were arguing that uh, the, uh, uh, the greater part of Australia should be returned to the Aboriginal people, to be administered under Aboriginal uh, law, uh, that Aboriginal, the Aboriginal nation should be able to uh, uh, become a part of the United Nations, that they should be able to establish uh, uh, diplomatic relations with neighbouring states, like I said before, Australia, mm -hmm. one of them. Um, and that massive, I mean, it, this is extraordinary. Not only that, the first ever, the first ever um, major national campaign against um, Aboriginal, uh, uh, the police brutality to Aboriginal people was organised in 1933 by the Darwin branch of the Communist Party, which at the time, if you think about it, must have consisted of about, about as many people as <laughs> in this room. But the other interesting thing about the Darwin Communist Party in the 19, at that time was that the Darwin Communist branch of the Communist Party was pretty much the only uh, multiracial branch. And they were instrumental in um, 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 breaking down that racial barrier within the party. Within the party, and, yeah, yeah. And they were also, well, I mean, they, they had a series of major national campaigns um, against, uh, I mean, it's a pretty extraordinary story. It's not, not, not well enough known in Australia, but I'm going to make sure it is. And people, people need to realise, but going back to what I said, I think it, it often had to do, it often had to do with either a small group of committed individuals who understood. But, you know, Mundy and Pringle and um, Joey Owens took their membership with them. Yeah, yeah. You know, they educated their membership. You know, they, this is one of the things, I mean, the New South Wales BLF under, under them guys, to me, to this day, I, I tip my hat to them. Yeah. In the same way as Chigga Dixon used to tip his hat to the, to the Wharfies who help, helped him and educated him and supported him and through him supported the Gurindjis. They took out that national uh, levy on their membership and raised 10 grand for the Gurindjis when the Gurindjis were in their toughest phase of their struggle in the Northern Territory. In 47? No, this is in 66. Oh, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. So, so how would you describe yourself politically? When I first met you, everyone told me you were, you're an anarchist, but like you speak every year at the Marxism event, you were involved in the Victoria, you joined the Victorian <laughs> Socialist back in 2018. Oh, wait, like, I mean, Victorian Socialist T-shirt, I'm a, you got, I'm a sort of not tonight, left, you got an existential lifetime member of the... Lifetime member? I mean, do you, do you have, would you, I suppose you're not really into self labelization but how would you call yourself, what would you call yourself politically? That's always the hardest question a lot. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a freedom fighter. 
you know, at the end of the day. I'm still, I'm still arguing and fighting the same, I'm still saying the same sort of stuff as I said 50 years ago. I've got videos of me speaking fucking 50 years ago and I look at that stuff and I listen to that stuff. The only difference between what I was saying 50 years ago and what I'm saying today, it may not seem apparent in this video, but uh, I think I'm, um, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm saying the same things in a way that gets through to a lot more people. I hope. I Maybe. think that I think you're onto something there. I mean, I think as I've got older, I think often I found that labels can just immediately put people off before they actually listen to what you have to say. Like in America, it's so polarized. Yeah. It's oh. very hard for any Democrat, even a good one, even a, like a left Democrat, mm. to get any echo amongst yeah. Republicans and many of whom are working class people. Well, America is so polarized at the moment; it's extraordinary. I mean, we're yeah. on the verge, I think, of the next American civil war. You know, because one side are all this is. I'm prejudiced, but one side are all lunatics and armed to the teeth, you know, it's, it would seem inevitable, you know, and they, I heard somebody in, somebody on Fox News that night saying that Sunni, whatever percent of Americans feel disenfranchised. Hang on a sec, you just had a vote, you lost, you know, what do you mean disenfranchised? But don't you think that a lot of people who voted for Obama got demoralised by that. Some of them ended up voting for Trump. So they're not necessarily racist. No, no. But they're just, it was like a fuck you vote to the establishment. I mean, most of the people must know that he's a, which, he's a charlatan. Which means, you know. it's, well, I don't know. We'll see, won't we? I mean, you know, I, I've followed um, one of the great joys of being in lockdown was I avidly followed uh, American politics through the whole yeah. Trump thing. I think it's really fascinating. And part of, I, I watch what's going on there because I I know that for uh, a lot of the 50 years of me doing things, that Australia has been, you know, very much influenced by what has occurred over there. You know, and I, I like to keep an eye on what's going there so I can anticipate what's likely to happen here. But I mean, the depressing thing about today is, I mean, the irony of social media. I mean, if we would have had social media 50 years ago, I mean, our means of communication back then were telegrams, if you want to get something fast, uh, letters, and if you wanted to ring someone up, they had to have a phone, which most of us didn't, but even if you wanted to ring someone, you go to, go to a phone box, uh, had to have some coins and stick in it, and if you wanted to ring London... Mostly vandalised as well. If you wanted to ring England, it took you, yeah. you know, almost half a day to get through. Whereas the irony today is with social media, you've got instant communication, you've got all these possibilities, you know, the extraordinary possibilities that exist with the technology, you know, the communication technology today. And I think to myself, what are people doing with it? They're fucking showing pictures of cats and, you know, talking about, you know, where they're going tonight. And it, it, in one sense, that's really depressing, you know, because in theory, the revolution should be here and almost over. I want to ask you a real simple question, but like, and it's on the, I suppose it's a depressing question, you know, like 50 years on from you, when you started, like Aboriginal people dying on average about eight years younger than non-Indigenous people, you know, uh, infant mortality over two times higher. Um, you know all of this stuff. If you, were, if you were Prime Minister tomorrow of a people's government, what would be the, the first three things that you would employ to deal with that? <laughs> I mean, just concretely. I mean, I'd, I'd abolish Centrelink. I'd establish a living wage subsidised through heavy taxing of the billionaires and the super rich, well, even the rich, um, and set about trying to create... I mean, uh, create the sort of society that I think most Australians if they were given the opportunity to think about without the, the megaphones from the, the Murdoch media and others, if they're given an opportunity to think about the sort of Australia that they would like to live in tomorrow, I think that there's, there'd, there'd be significant opportunities to create that sort of society and create justice for all Aboriginal people and all dispossessed and all refugees and all the downtrodden at the same time. I mean, there's... As you well know, there's, 
there's no need, there should be no need for anyone to live in poverty in a country this wealthy, you know. Tax the shit out of uh, uh, Gina Reinhardt and, and all of the super wealthy. Um, so what if, uh, you know, a billionaire is reduced to living on a, a million dollars a year, you know? Um, and all that extra wealth uh, can go into creating better things for everybody, you know, a more equitable society, a society where, you know, nobody has to starve, nobody has to uh, die, you know, 30 years younger, you know? And that um, disparity in life expectancy constantly um, is a reminder for me and anyone my age, I'm 71 and the ma majority of the brothers and sisters who stood with me, Aboriginal brothers and sisters who stood with me at the Aboriginal Embassy in Fort de Cobbers, the majority of them are dead. And more than half of them died more than 20 years ago, you know? And that's really frustrating. But one of the features, I think, of politics today is the lack of political representation for working class people, indigenous people. Like back in the day, for all its faults, I mean, most people were in unions, the Labour Party was a mass organisation, mm. as was the Liberal Party, I guess, but today that's obviously not the case. They're like a media thing. I mean, do you see any possibility in Australia, for example, that the Labour Party could change for the better? Like, for example, like it briefly did in England under Corbyn, or do you think that's just a total waste of time? That's never going to happen. It's a difficult thing. I mean, I, I think that the Labor Party is so um, um, enmeshed in in um, capitalism that it's not possible for them as a party. Well, they're not a Labor Party anymore, yeah. you know, and um, almost all sort of. Uh, mainstream, well, virtually all mainstream political parties are so far to the fucking right, it's ridiculous. Um, I don't really see any meaningful, significant change happening within my lifetime. You know, I, but then in saying that, I will simply be uh, the latest in um, a long line of uh, Aboriginal political activists going back to the 1920s when my great grandfather when my you know, my great grandfather was in the AAPA the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association the first modern aboriginal political organization 1924 uh, every generation of aboriginal political activists have uh, gone to their grave knowing that um, their um, desires and dreams and political aspirations had not uh, been realised within their lifetime. I'll go the same, you know. So with Lydia Thorpe, you must be really proud of her. I mean, you know her family well. Um, she's come from public housing, single mum, and now she's probably one of the most prominent politicians on the continent at the moment. But, so, but do you think that her, par her party is basically based in the inner city and the more like richer inner cities, so like places like here? There's Fitzroy. two parts of that question. On Invasion Day this year, I think I said in my speech in front of Parliament House on that fantastic uh, PA system, I said there's rule number one. I've got a message for all you young people out there. Rule number one, all politicians, and then I, as I was about to say <laughs> it, because th Lydia had just been on just before me, I said, oh shit. And I looked around and said she was still there, and then I finished it. All politicians are bastards, except Lydia, Th Lydia Thorpe. <laughs> and I was only talking about state government, mate. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I long ago lost faith in the sort of political system we've got in Australia. Um, I don't see it as a way of um, addressing, let alone solving the bloody problems that confront all of us. But in Lydia, um, I see hope, you know. I see in Lydia someone who 
has the same sort of idealism that I once had. And I think that's important. I think it's important for young people to, you know, fucking idealism is not a bad thing, you know. It's, it's important to have a vision, you know. And um, the reason I love Lydia, I knew her before she was born. And her mother um, was at that conference, anti-racism conference in 1972 that I spoke about that, that happened when McMahon made his statement. Her mother was very much part of the, and still, you know, mother still is. Um, so she's got, and with an uncle like Robbie Thorpe, <laughs> I mean, how can, she's not yeah, allowed yeah. to put a foot wrong. I can imagine. So she's got, and her, you know, her grandmother, Aunty uh, Alma, she, She's one of the legendary um, old matriar matriarchs of the, of the Victorian scene down here. So, and Lydia is the latest in a long, in a line, going back to even her great grandmother, Auntie Edna. Lydia is the latest in a in a strong, long line of uh, of uh, Aboriginal women, you know. And she's, uh, you know, I've got great faith in Lydia. Uh, in terms of her party. Um, I'm, well, I was really angry. I'm, as a resident of Northcote for, for 30 years or more, I was um, really angry about what the Greens did to Alex Patel. She should have won. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Lydia um, steers her path through the, mm. the minefield of her own party pol politics and the broader politics in general. But I, I think she's made an admirable start. She's a strong, smart young woman. She knows uh, what it's all about. She's um, got uh, a lot more experience under her belt at a young age than half of the politicians and people she deals and with life in experience. camera. Yeah. And she's in my mind, to my way of thinking, she's got far more integrity than any of the current uh, crop of uh, Aboriginal federal parliamentarians. I just want to finish on a, on a positive note because you must be really proud of this. You know, you, you talk, you said, sound a little bit pessimistic there, but like back not very long ago, every, almost every day in Melbourne, there'd be a union demonstration, environmental demonstration, an anti-war demonstration, and now it's dead. And every year on Invasion Day, You've got up to 80,000, mainly young people, led by these mainly women, indigenous activists, and you're like the godfather of the whole thing. or one not, of the, not mainly like, women, almost exclusively, well, oh, exclusively women. There's there basically a small that, group. It's the most exciting interest oh, in I, democratic this is, things. This is, this, is, um, this is what gives me hope. I've said yeah. it in other places, but the, the young women of war, the warriors, the Aboriginal resistance, uh, the, especially the Melbourne... Um, collective um, are magnificent, you know? and and the great the other great thing about them is they are, um, for the most part, children or grandchildren of those mob who were part of what we did back in the day. So they've got a good um, they've got a good uh, political grounding. They've got a good um, base from which they're coming, and the proofs in the pudding, you know. I mean. Um, the crowds they got in the last couple of years that's oh, amazing uh, are probably better than some of the ones we pulled in the old days that I like to skite about so that's great and the media have given them a hard time and it's just built built support for them and I would they'll they'll have my support for as long as they doing that sort of stuff and the other thing about you say the last year or two part of the um, problem I think uh, generally is this um, this um, COVID thing, which has sort of inhibited a lot of things. But then by the same token, I, COVID has enabled me to think that I don't ever really need to leave home again. I can teach from home. <laughs> Anything I want gets delivered to the door almost within minutes. And uh, being this age, it doesn't worry me if I never go out again. And again. you just got half a million dollars. Well, it's, it's actually more like three million. I've three million? A, well, My I've got God. another 500,000 for... Well, the Northern's probably got a five hundred thousand. I've got a, another f uh, five hundred thousand dollar project to tell the story and history of the Aboriginal Health Service. 
So you which can finance fact, a revolution now, not which just it, well, lead it. The history of the health service, and I'm only doing the first 25 year history of the health service when it functions. The history of the health service is in fact a history of those women that I'm talking about. Yeah, Auntie yeah, Edna yeah. and the women who were right there from the and beginning. And that's Lydia's grandmother. Yep, yeah. uh, Lydia, that's Lydia's great-grandmother. Great-grandmother. Then there's her grandmother, Auntie Alma, who I worked with for most of the last um, 30 or 40 years. And there. I was on the board of the health service here for about 20 years with Auntie Alma and that. Um, and, and then Marge and now Lydia, you know? Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> That's all. Now I, I've got, I've got great faith and hope, and um, Lydia's primary problem problem is likely to be how to steer away through the internal politics of her own party. But I reckon she's um, uh, in a really strong position in terms of you know, she's got staunch and solid support from the Aboriginal community all but the black bourgeoisie, but that's to be expected. <laughs> Gary Foley, thanks for coming on the show. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks no worries. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.